Good morning. Hopefully you guys have great breakfast and today is the second day of the conference and my name is Nassim Ali and I'm going to show uh, who is going to be our amazing first keynote. His name is Paul Fakins, um, he's from Data Mixer and he's expert in digital transformation and he loves thinking about wicked societal problems and how so technology and innovation can help us evolve towards human-centric and a fair data economy. And today he will be elaborating why data economy needs to become more demand-driven in order to be successful. Paul, the stage is yours. Hey, good morning. Uh, so as said, Paul uh, Tejskis, I'm uh, from Belgium. I've been working on uh, internet projects for the last 20 years. I had an, uh, a web agency back in the beginning of the internet, which I uh, sold to a telco in Belgium. Then um, I did digital transformation for telecom, uh, worked for media, um, for Pech Group, one of the largest uh, Pech, uh, media companies in, uh, in Europe. And then the um, last five years I worked in mobility, and also on my data, um, uh, sorry, the Brussels Hub, and uh, so that's a bit of my background. I uh, would like to talk to you today about commons. Um, we see today that um, in the European data economy, um, that uh, one of the main stories is about the evolution towards commons. Basically, what we see is that big data, uh, big tech, the GAFA, the GAFA players that we all know, Google, Amazon and the others, they all have a common data platform which all of our data uh, is in that platform and basically um, that is what I would like to talk about today and uh, the commons um, need a specific way of looking at it and so that's what I in today's session would like to just um, give you an, uh, more information about human-centric design, about the steps needed to uh, get that platform up and running. And um, as a first step, um, the data commons is actually the third generation of platforms uh, out there. Um, I base myself upon the IDC and Lisbon um, report uh, of the, uh, the data monitor that you can find online of the European Commission. And there um, they show the different generations. Uh, the data commons today is a platform that contains all of the big data um, in uh, a cloud-centric environment that is real-time, such as we know in Facebook, in Google, in Amazon, and other platforms, which allow to get all of the data together and um, really uh, perform uh, predictive, prescriptive AI on, on those platforms. And so this third generation is now something that, as my data, we are looking at, and uh, there, I think we have a lot of, uh, lots of opportunities. Um, what we see also in the in the report uh, that you can find online, um, the uh, European Data Monitoring Tool um, that you can find um, online, it, it shows uh, the business case of uh, the digital economy, of the data economy, and they estimate in 2025 about um, 800 billion of business case for digital transformation. And in that report, also, there are three main stories. Three main stories. The first one is about health data, that there is an opportunity, if we bring all of that health data together, that um, we can find new correlations and also get better treatment for people. Um, the second story in that report is about the impact of the data columns. So that's basically what uh, I'm talking about today, is that we need to bring all of that data together in data commons. Uh, the third story is about data spaces. As you might know, the central strategy of Europe is around creating data sharing, about enabling data sharing and data spaces, which is now being set up. A number of people here at the conference also from IDSA, from, from Gaia Inks, um, you, uh, Europe 27 cloud providers, um, allow us to share data, allow the data economy to start flowing, 
And to create this, uh, this opportunity of the 800 billion euro benefit that we estimate to the, uh, to the European data economy. Now, there are a few, in the report, there are a few um, important lessons. First one is that we have to become demand driven. What does that mean? Uh, demand driven? The internet today and the big tech players have focused on the demand. Amazon, Google have focused on finding the right search engine for people, finding the right products that people needed. So the demand was actually the key of being successful. The second story in this report is about that there are new governance models. New governance models like data commons, cooperatives, uh, not the centralized big tech way of uh, managing all of the data of us as people, but uh, alternative ways. Uh, Web3 has alternative ways in the, the new DAOs, uh, the, the decentralized uh, management of, of those data platforms, but also um, what we look at in our market today, um, 4P. Today we have public-private partnerships uh, in the market, market-driven public-private partnerships. What we see, the 4P model is adding the people participation, so that we have public-private people participation. So it's an, another form of uh, data commons. And um, data trust is another emerging uh, way of managing that data where we, I, as a user, will give a third um, party, um, what we call fiduciary, like I am assigning my tax um, deposits to an accountant in Belgium. In this way, we now see that people, because they don't manage their own privacy, they don't manage, they just click yes, yes, yes on every banner that we see without even reading what's, what's been done. We see uh, an evolution towards people delegating their um, the right of consent to managing their data to third parties like data trust. And uh, finally, what we see in the demand business case that you can read online is that um, everything needs to happen in a pre-competitive um, atmosphere where people share data because there's no real top-down business case yet. And so uh, we see initiatives like regulatory sandboxes that um, emerge in the market where People only share within a controlled environment where they have a complete legal department looking at uh, what's being shared with them. And so, um, the next important uh, initiative at this moment is what we call the Public Digital Infrastructure Movement. There, uh, we see a report from Europe that's interesting to, to, to read about the future of government, which shows different scenarios that we we are going to uh, different scenarios that point out um, the way that our data is managed in the future. Because, as we all recognize today, uh, already um, the way our data is managed has an influence. Has an influence how, over the past few years, um, our uh, political uh, and elections have been managed or have been steered in a certain direction. Has have an influence on our daily life. And so, some of the initiatives by civic society um, around uh, public digital infrastructure are very interesting, saying, hey, we have to invest, uh, Europe has to put up a public technology fund to help our governments, because today our governments are not capable of doing that themselves, and the current way of working with fixed scope tenders that then are put out in the market doesn't, over the last few years, doesn't really guarantee the best uh, societal service as public digital infrastructure. So those are some of the interesting uh, evolutions going on at the moment. And um, um, finally, what we think there on Society 5.0, is a movement in Japan by the Japanese government, in the, that introduced what we call agile governance. That governance is not something at this moment where you can think ahead of what will be the future state, because we don't know what the future state will be of, uh, of government. So actually that uh, needs what they call agile governance, where you are able to test governance and evolve as you go. But we are not human-centric. We talk about human centricity for the last 10 years, but we don't walk the walk, as you say. Um, this is an important one. Uh, you might, some of you might have seen it, the Citra Digipower study. Um, 
Actually, what one of the main findings of the Digi uh, Power uh, Citra study, and I would suggest everyone to read it because it's very enlightening, is that digital power, once you get big, like the big tech does, um, it's self-reinforcing. It's uh, it means that it actually uh, your power grows bigger uh, as you amass more data, and it uh, it also shows that it clearly individuals have totally no control over their data today. A lot of initiatives like, for instance, Tim Berners-Lee just started a few years ago on an initiative called SOLID, uh, focusing on the human in control. Now, the CITRA report clearly shows that we have no control over our data. And, uh, for instance, an interesting one was um, an initiative by someone in Finland, um, and not just, just anyone, on getting their data from Facebook, getting, um, asking their, for their data, and it shows the whole endurance test, as they call it, uh, to, uh, to show that it's actually not really simple to know what people are doing or even get that data. And so, um, my final call out, because um, it's all about comms today, is that in the report, again, um, data collectives, uh, my data operators, and DAOs, distributed anonymous uh, organizations, are needed to, to strengthen that bargaining power, to bring that data of people together with the consent of the people, uh, because they're not able to do it themselves. They're not able, and maybe not interested as well. Uh, so that's uh, basically um, an important uh, background to, to our discussion. Um, now, this all happened because um, the internet was designed wrong. If you look over there, um, you see that up to the network, the telecom network, everything is very well regulated by government. But on top of that, what we call the internet, Tim Berners-Lee and Vince Cerf from Belgium, they designed this thing wrong because there's no governance in that. And this one is uh, the spectrum of public telco is managed by government, but this part is not managed, it's not, they're missing a governance layer. So we could say to Tim Berners Lee, well, you designed this thing wrong. Um, but that's basically what created the big tech monopolies because they could do anything they want and their code is law at this moment. And that's why we have to bring them back to what uh, the My Data movement stands for. And that means that um, today we are looking at the, the My Data model um, to bring everything back centralized on the, on the user. And one of these initiatives, um, you can look at reports from the Ada Lovelace uh, Institute, you can look at uh, what uh, Sylvie Delacroix in France is doing, studying these new uh, data governance uh, forms such as data trust, data cooperatives, in which I as a user give my data, give my data to um, a centralized or um, a decentralized organization managing it for me, and uh, we have an initiative in Belgium uh, announced at uh, Open Belgium last year in which we're bringing, setting up a data trust to experiment with uh, what is going on. Um, my data in the European data strategy is an, an important movement to uh, get people to focus on that, um, to focus on uh, public services, on the data spaces in a European context that people are made aware that it needs to be human centric. Um, my data and the organization that worked, worked on the different data governance act, the AI act, the data act, the important um, initiatives in law, in um, directives of Europe, to be able to implement this fair data economy and uh, the my data operators are the best way to do it. Now, this human-centered thinking in uh, the European data spaces are important. Um, we want to develop interoperability, we want to have that data shared. And then at 11 o'clock there is a, a workshop in which um, Vasco Group in, in Helsinki or in Finland created um, a connector to connect the personal data spaces of the MyData operators, human-centric personal data spaces, to the uh, data spaces of Europe too, the data spaces for healthcare, the data spaces for mobility, and all of the different data spaces that are being set up. And they created um, a connector that standardizes the data flow with human consent uh, centrally. So 
Um, they did that together with um, the Open Agile Smart Cities initiative and uh, using the MIMS for minimum interoperability mechanisms. And so there we see that interoperability is happening um, to all of those different my data operators can be interoperable and can share that data. Now, getting um, the my data promise uh, executed requires what we call digital transformation steps. Um, we have a three-step approach. Um, the first one is to, first of all, define um, what problem you need to solve. Um, for me personally, the social problem that I need to solve, and also in, in the market in Europe, is that we have a big problem with energy today, as, as all of you know. Um, not just because of Putin, but also because of the energy market, the liberated energy market, and some of those issues around uh, um, the, uh, the green deal and the climate problem that we have. We see that, uh, for me personally, in my family budget, uh, mobility, energy and housing are a big chunk of worries uh, that uh, people are confronted with. So, if we look at the wicked problems that we need to solve, this is an important one. Uh, we see that funding in, uh, needs to be framed in a pre-competitive environment, as we said. So, we have to um, find that data and bring it together and see where we can solve that problem. And um, this, these are some of the initiatives that we're doing in Belgium. Um, bike data um, has now about 10,000 users contributing their bike data to uh, the cities and regional um, mobility initiatives. Um, we have uh, your window on local traffic, that's a sensor-based uh, 4,000 people who actually put a sensor on their window to manage and to monitor the activity in their street, which is around school districts. So, uh, having all of the data around school districts. Then we have on the left uh, the bottom, I think this one, uh, street finches, it's called. Uh, once a year, about 8,000 people all over Belgium uh, use their phone to capture for one year, for one hour, all of the data in their street. And that street finches allow us to monitor what we call um, the livability, the air quality, and a number of other things in, in their street. And so these are some of the uh, already happening citizen science, um, my data projects in, in Belgium around mobility. And we bring all, all of that together, and uh, on the bottom right you see, for instance, uh, something called driver seat. That's a cooperative driver seat where gig workers, like people who, as a chauffeur, drive for Uber, for Lyft, for a number of others, get their data together and they share that. And then that data is processed and is actually reused in a city context. And uh, my mobility data, it has uh, my profile of what I do. If I, how many miles I walk, how many miles I drive with my bike, how many miles I do with the car, all of that is in my cell phone. We have um, in Holland about 10,000 people who use their smartphone monitoring to do public research of the, the German, of the Dutch government around mobility profiling, about um, what is the, uh, the people movement in a certain area. And this can be used for um, road suitability tracking, for uh, inclusivity scoring, for um, eco mobility scoring, and for uh, solving a number of issues around safe mobility. For instance. Um, we have bike flow. Um, we have a number of projects where all of the bike data is being shared, as shown in the previous one. But also, we see more and more that cars are connected, uh, as you. See on this slide, um, Mercedes Benz has about uh, 20,000 vans in Belgium already now, today, uh, connected, and which is fed to uh, the city council and fed to the, um, the transport uh, management. Um, and in this way, uh, bringing all of that data together allows us to solve some of those problems. And um, using that data, this is an example of City Flows project in Mechelen, in Brussels, in Ghent, uh, that has today already a digital twin of the city and which allows, powered by this citizen data, to solve some of those societal issues around noise, around air quality, around uh, traffic data. 
And um, what we believe in in technology is that uh, the personal digital twin is uh, something that's now in development, in which um, we see more and more that it's technology today we've been monitoring, we've been showing dashboards, but as we grow more intelligent in the next in the next iterations of this technology, we become semantically, contextually aware of what this means, and we can get all that information in a commons and get it together. But then, of course, it requires what we in my data call a personal digital twin commons operator. Because, as you know, Google Maps has, in ways, have 90% market share today in the market. That is because they have all that data together, they know all of the context, and they have prescriptive, predictive opportunity. This is what we have to do ourselves with the example of mobility. And so the data sources, we all have smartphones, we have sensors, and which allow us to share that data and to process it by regions, communities, in a good way. And we think that this connecting that data to um, this is an example of the German uh, mobility data space that is in operation today, which the digital twin of bike sharing, uh, step sharing, bus sharing, car sharing, not just from the car itself, from that step, but also from the personal digital twin that actually validates as an external source all of that data and bring that together in uh, the ecosystem of the mobility data space and Gaia X allows us to uh, create value and give it back as, for instance, reduction of my mobility budget. Uh, and those are some of the uh, data space activities that we're setting up. I see that I'm out of time, so I will go further uh, and just complete the, the step two. After we've defined the, the problem, uh, we see that we have to build the right thing using data pooling, using uh, pre-commercial procurement, which is an innovation of Europe, important one because today in the tenders, which have a fixed scope and then are put in the market and then take five years to perform, especially in mobility, I've seen some of those projects go on for five years, but just a simple ticketing system. Pre-commercial procurement in Brussels, for instance, is used to uh, by the public uh, transport operator and the Brussels government to share data of movement of people. So if you share the data of people uh, getting out of buses and trams in Brussels, the people of the shared bikes and other uh, multimodal uh, offers can see when do we need to put which type of transport when people are getting out of the bus. So sharing that data allows a better integration between different modes of transport. And that's uh, a typical project that is done using the commercial procurement, uh, not having to tender out things for a year and delaying um, uh, innovation in that way. What we also see is that in step two, we have to, in order to build the right thing, do sandboxing. A regulatory sandboxing is a way, in the AI Act, for instance, it's one of the um, ways to do it, to bring all that people together to test mobility. For instance, if I have an e-bike, I bring them to the city of Mecklenburg, we have, as shown in the city flow as an example, we have all of the data of mobility, so the e-bike can automatically do a test and then see, okay, um, at 6 o'clock at night, um, there's too many bikes on this road, so we need, as a policy, dynamically to take away one car lane to give extra room for the bikers. And that's what this uh, sandbox is all about. Um, the sandbox, there is in the report um, that I will put in the slides as well after the, after the session. There's an interesting overview of the dynamic um, regulatory sandboxes that are now in play. In Hamburg, an electronic bus um, and autonomous transport is now being tested in a regulatory sandbox because people then share data with a legal firm specialized in internet rights next to it. Um, and also, all of these players, they are able to look at what is happening without competitive worries, without uh, running a certain liability risk, because in the sandbox, it's all very well managed. So, that's step two, how to build the thing right. In step three, 
And that's all about digital transformation. It's all about agile. It's about um, we need cloud centric continuous improvement um, in order to be successful in the future. And that's um, as a conclusion. I want to just repeat first of all, focus on the demand um, of the the problem to solve of the user and the society, then organize human-centric design and societal ecosystem together with people, together with society, together with um, governments, and then build and scale what's needed with the examples of mobility as uh, an example. I thank you very much uh, for your time, and um, I hope you found it interesting.